Welcome to Conozca Sus Derechos, Know Your Rights. This program is brought to you by the Hispanic Bar Association of Central Florida. It is our mission to inform our community of important legal topics affecting us all, and today we will be talking about immigration issues. I am Henry Lim, the Community Relations Chair of the Hispanic Bar Association of Central Florida. Today we will discuss various topics relating to immigration law. We will be discussing common mistakes and misconceptions surrounding these issues and provide information on where to go for help. We will not discuss political opinions and it is our intention to simply inform the community of the relevant topics in a non-biased approach. During our program, we will hear from various professionals in our community who are quite knowledgeable in the area of immigration law. Let's begin by introducing Melissa mcguire Maniao. Melissa, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm the Vice President of the Florida Immigrant Coalition, uh, and in that capacity I serve the immigrant, right, the immigrant community. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for participating today. And also with us today is Attorney Jorge Sevilla. Jorge, hi, how are hi, you? Hi, how are you doing? Good. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm an experienced immigration attorney here in the or greater Orlando area. Uh, I also used to work for um, immigration in the field of uh, the Miami Asylum Office. So I do have some experience in immigration, and I also come from an immigrant background, which motivated me to uh, take on this practice. Very good. Welcome to the program, and thank you very much for participating with us today. And let's just go ahead and, and jump right into it. Uh, Melissa, there has been a lot of talk about comprehensive immigration reform. Can you give us a, a little bit of a background as to what this topic is all about? It attempts to address the brokenness of the system, um, attempts to categorize um, groups of people into the ones that have been waiting in the backlog, um, the undocumented population that currently exists, um, the agricultural community, the um, the youth, the dreamers, and put them in a path to legalization, legal permanent residence, that is an ultimately citizenship. But when they mentioned that it's comprehensive, I assume that it, they are also including other topics. What is that Correct. comprehensive? What does that mean? It is a attempts to do a holistic approach. It's a one one bill that addresses the issues from both sides of the aisle. The Republicans have their sets of concerns, Democrats have their sets of concerns, and it tries to um, include all of that, um, such as E-Verify, uh, entry exit system, um, border security. So it is a comprehensive immigration reform bill. And who uh, sponsored the bill? How did that come about? Well, it started in the Senate, um, Senate Bill 744, and, um, and it went through the Gang of Eight, um, basically four Republicans, four Democrats, um, put forth several proposals, amendments, and it passed um, with an overwhelming um, bipartisan support. Um, and then it went over to the House, and it's been there ever since. And the House version of that uh, ha was modified, um, and now it's H.R. 15. Um, essentially similar to the Senate bill um, with some uh, differences on the on the border uh, security piece. That piece came from a committee that uh, was also a bipartisan committee that came with some other recommendations on how to address the concerns at the border. But essentially they're very similar. And there have been a lot of concerns with the border, uh, especially in 2014 we've seen an influx of uh, mainly Central American children entering the United States. Jorge, you want to tell us a little, a little bit about what's going on in these Central American countries? Why are we uh, getting such an influx of uh, mainly youths entering the United States? Well, yes, over the last two years uh, this influx has been anticipated and this year it just seemed to boil over. Uh, coming through our borders are a lot of what, what are called unaccompanied minors. And in this situation, these children are ranging from ages of two to teenage years, and they're looking to, for a better life. Uh, right now, the situation in those countries, such as Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador, are experiencing a lot of gang-related violence. So that is why there's such an influx over the last couple of years. And how are they entering the United States? Well, at this time, when they enter, they have no guardian available. So when they come through, they either have to go through the Office of Refugee Resettlement and then either placed with, um, with the state or if they're able to find somebody that's going to take care of them, they're placed within the guardianship of that person. Are there any immigration, uh, is there any sort of relief available from an immigration law point of view? From an immigration law point of view, um, 
a lot of times these children, some of them have experienced some severe hardship, uh, gang violence, or some type of violence that may lead them to apply for asylum as an unaccompanied minor. Uh, the other avenue would be uh, a little bit more complex, dealing with state law issues as well. And once they are able to apply for asylum, what, how is that process? How does a child coming to the United States apply? How do they start that process? Well, it starts with the basis of, of all asylum law is that you have to apply based on persecution or a fear of future persecution um, on the five protective grounds uh, that, the, that the law finds. The five protective grounds are political um, opinion, religion, national, nationality, I'm sorry, um, particular social group, or even race. And they would have to be case specific. Uh, it's a case specific based on the circumstances of that case. So for example, a child coming from Honduras who has experienced a, um, some, type, some type of violence based on gang related um, would try to have to fit into a particular social group based on them trying to either refuse to join a group. Um, but a lot of times these cases have been thrown, thrown out in court or they have failed uh, the scrutiny of, of asylum law or you would have to find other grounds, other circumstances that would fall under one of the protective grounds. And you, you mentioned asylum, and we see people from uh, different countries oftentimes um, at a specific period of time try to all apply for asylum. Not all, but a good majority of them try to apply for asylum. And we're seeing in 2013, 2014 with problems in countries such as Venezuela that uh, a lot of people are uh, thinking about applying for asylum. Uh, what do you say to people who say, I'm from Venezuela, I want to have asylum? I say be very cautious. Be very careful who you approach. Um, because the thing is, you, even though they're, they're, the government recognizes that there are issues in that country, such as in Venezuela, you still have to file under the five protective grounds. So a lot of times these people, even though they feel they may be persecuted in a sense or they have suffered some type of harm, it has to be based on one of the protected grounds. They would have to, for example, um, a Venezuelan person who was a part of a political or opposition party to the regime in Venezuela could possibly file for political asylum but it's very factual specific. It has to um, meet the standards of, of our court system and, it, and you have to prove that you were involved in, in, in a political group. What type of involvement did you have? Were you a member? How long were you a member? What type of evidence do you have to support that claim? What type of fear? Do you have family that's still living in that country? So there's certain facts that you have to show for you to be able to apply for asylum. Not everybody that comes from Venezuela, unfortunately, will be able to apply for asylum. Great, thank you. And uh, Melissa, you're uh, on the board of directors of the Florida Immigrant Coalition, correct? Correct. Right. And what does that organization do? We exist to serve the immigrant community and protecting their rights um, at the local, state, and federal level. Okay. And how did you become involved with this organization? I, I lived through a personal experience with my husband when we got married. He was undocumented. And uh, I'm born in Puerto Rico, um, didn't really have any experience with the immigration system prior to marrying my husband. And um, I took it upon myself to research his case because um, in hearing his story, it appeared to me that there were a lot of mistakes made and I wanted to be sure not to make any more. Um, and in researching his um, case, I uncovered uh, those mistakes and um, they were primarily done by people that claimed to be experts and basically they ruined his case and so to undo those mistakes were very costly, very painful, took us many years, many thousands of dollars and so um, through personal experience I, I became connected to the organization and now I advocate on behalf of other families in similar c circumstances. Great, thank you. And, and, and George, uh, Melissa just mentioned something that uh, is very important that she went through several um, she sought help. They sought help, but they, through erroneous uh, advice, notarios mistakes, notarios. Can you talk a little bit about that problem? Because it seems to be a, a systematic problem in, in the immigration field as far as notarios. Uh, what, what experience do you have with that? It has become quite of a problem. I have a lot of clients coming to me, um, you know, telling me, well, well, we were trying to find somebody that could just help us, you know, just file the paperwork. But it's not that simple. It's not just about filing the paperwork. It's when you're filing these forms, whichever form it may be, whether to petition for a family member, apply for naturalization, these are not just forms. These are legal documents that once you write whatever you, what facts you state in this document could be held against you in the future. 
So you have to have um, knowledge or you have to have somebody that's experienced with that. And that's why we have people that are, um, go to law school and are barred in this area of the law. So going to an otario, trying to save a couple dollars here and there is not worth the headache you'll get later on. You know, when you find out that you're going to be placed in removal proceedings or you're going to be denied citizenship, so now you either have to appeal or wait five more years before you can file because of simple mistakes that could have been avoided had you seen the, the right professional at that time. Melissa, tell us a little bit about that because you have firsthand experience with that. What is it like to be or have a family member under removal proceedings? What is that like? It was horrible. Um, I had immigration agents come to my house three times and at the third time he was apprehended and taken away and he was in detention uh, center which is like a jail and um, and at that moment I thought I was losing my husband and my kids thought they were losing their their father my husband came when he was 17 and he um, has lived in the country at that point over 25 years working paying taxes um, had no criminal record mom was a naturalized citizen I'm an I'm a US citizen and a veteran so for me it was it was a very scary thought um, and I didn't know how to fight and and it was my community that stood by my side to help me in that fight um, and and so this is my way of giving back but it's very um, I, I don't wish that upon anybody and so um, that's why it's important for people to become um, aware of the issue and educated and really know the facts because there's a lot of misinformation out there and so that would just be my uh, encouragement to the community is to really really understand this issue um, and I think that through understanding we can come to a solution for the problem. And prior to your experience with your husband did you have any uh, experience or knowledge as to what one undergoes when they're under an immigration process? No, none at all. I it was self-taught. I, I took a ca apart his case. I researched it. I mean, it was over 20 years worth of documents. It took years to piece together. And whatever um, words I didn't understand, I looked it up on the Internet. Um, and I, uh, it was like a jigsaw puzzle. And I created a timeline um, from the moment he came in at 17 years old to uh, the time we got married, which was he was 38. Um, and, uh, and that's how I was able to piece together what happened, when, who did what, and that enabled me to defend him. Very good. Stick around for a moment here. Uh, we will take a break. Stay tuned as we discuss many other topics in immigration law. Welcome back to Conozca Sus Derechos, Know Your Rights, programming brought to you by the Hispanic Bar Association of Central Florida. I am Henry Lim, Community Relations Chair of the Hispanic Bar Association of Central Florida. With us today to discuss immigration matters are Jorge Sevilla and Melissa mcguire Manyao. Welcome back. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about some of the changes that have occurred in the recent years. One of them uh, deals a lot with what people call dreamers. Who are dreamers? Dreamers are minors, children that were brought to the United States, um, usually by their parents. Uh, they grow up here, they go to school here, they pledge allegiance to our flag, um, and essentially they are American in every way but on paper. And um, so they're in an undocumented status, um, but they live here and grew up here. And has there been any sort of legal relief for these dreamers? Actually, there has been. Um, in 2013, uh, the, go the government or an executive action was passed as a deferred action uh, for childhood arrivals. What it is, it doesn't actually give these children um, status, legal, lawful status here in the United States, but what it does is it, it protects them from being removed from the country. And there's very specific requirements involved. Um, basically, you have to show that this, this child came in before the age of 16 and that they were here uh, prior to June 15, 2007. Oh. Oh, well, they were living continuously from, yeah, and, then, and the main part is that they have to be under the age of 31 but prior to June 15, 2012. Additionally, they have to either have a GED, be in school, or have a high school diploma, and more specifically, they should not have been charged with a felony, a significant misdemeanor, or three or more misdemeanors. Um, so those are the requirements, and there's certain ways to prove those requirements as well. Well, uh, a lot of times, uh, one of the problems that we see, and maybe uh, you can touch upon this, Melissa, is that uh, 
the children come from several countries and when they come to the United States they don't necessarily go straight to school. Mm -hmm. uh, it is common in certain cultures uh, to go straight to work mm -hmm. even as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, how do these individuals prove that they've been here for uh, since June of 2007? How, uh, what kind of documents can these children obtain? Well, I actually worked uh, as an intern and in a law firm, and I uh, primarily handled the DACA cases. And so in those cases, they would bring employment records. Um, they would bring uh, records f uh, for volunteer work that they would do in the community. And, and there are lots of ways that they can, uh, very creative ways, but nonetheless prove their physical presence uh, in the United States. Um, and a lot of them do go to school, even if it's sporadic, it still shows physical presence. Um, and, uh, and, and they do want an education. And so that's oftentimes uh, a very easy thing to fix. They yeah. go back to school, re-enroll, and, um, and basically um, get their two years. Now, you said that it does not afford the legal status, but at the same time, it allows them to remain in the United States. Correct. What, uh, what other benefits do they get? Other benefits? Well, they're able to apply for work authorization, uh, and with that comes the, other be the added benefit of receiving a Social Security uh, number, being able to file taxes under that Social Security number if they are employed. Also, receive other uh, receive your driver's license, especially here in Florida. It's, it's so hard to obtain the driver's license for people with undocumented status, and um, th at least they're able to now enter school. They have a f they have a method of continuing their education beyond the high school years as well. Right. And that Florida driver's license issue is something that I wanted to touch upon because, uh, Melissa, you're very involved with the Florida Immigrant Coalition and as far as uh, the driver's license. Can you explain what's going on in Florida with the driver's license? What is needed? What's going on with that? Well, in our community, um, it is the lack of a valid driver's license that causes a lot of um, the undocumented to end up in removal or detention, I should say. And so um, we have uh, an initiative called um, Drive Safe Sunshine State. And, um, and what we'd like to see is legislation reintroduced. It's been introduced before and it's not passed. And so um, working in the community, there is um, a lot of interest in seeing that come um, through um, and be signed into law, allowing um, undocumented individuals to be able to obtain a driver's license, which essentially means safe, safer roads. Um, it would be a boost to the economy because, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll have to pay for a driver's license, they'll have to get uh, car insurance, they'll have to pass a driver's test. Um, so there's a, a lot of good reasons um, for, for all involved, really, um, as a citizen driving on the roads, if you get into an accident um, and, and, and someone doesn't have insurance, then that could be an economic situation for you. So for a multitude of reasons, um, that's why we have this campaign. And, and, and as we explain the issue, I haven't gotten any pushback from anybody. Um, so that, that's really the, the, the crux of the issue. And Jorge, what are the minimum requirements in the state of Florida to obtain a driver's license? To obtain a driver's license in the state of Florida, um, basically you need to either have a work authorization card like we just spoke about or approve some type of non-immigrant status. Um, you have to have a notification from CI U USCIS, which is U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, indicating your length of stay here or indicating what status you have. Additionally, there are other um, documents that you may show, um, whether you have an immigration court hearing, you can present that, Board of Immigration Appeals, um, ap appeal pending before the board. Uh, also, you can also show um, approved applications, uh, such as adjustment applications or other applications um, as asylum applications that have been approved. Some of the other recent changes that we've heard about uh, deal with something that's called prosecutorial discretion. Can you touch a little bit about what does that mean? Yes, prosecutorial discretion is um, discretion allowed either to immigration officers with ICE or to immigration counsel uh, dealing with uh, cases and removal proceedings. A lot of the times, um, in order to alleviate the pressure on the, on the court system, the immigration court system, there's um, ways to ask for discretion um, based on certain factors. Time of stay in the United States, uh, good moral character being you pay, the person pays their taxes, uh, if they have uh, ties to the community, if they're part of a, of a, a community organization, a church, or if they also have uh, children here, U.S. citizen children. For a person who's in removal proceedings, it will be quite difficult to remove uh, a parent if their children are here and are minors. So 
those are factors that uh, the government takes into consideration, either into administratively closing a case or terminating a case outright to allow the person to remain here to see possibly if later on they'll be able to apply for some type of status. Now, Melissa, you have some experience with that, some first-hand experience, mm -hmm. I understand. Can you right. tell us a little bit about that? Um, essentially, when I, when I met my husband, he was um, in, in uh, undocumented status. He had an order of deportation. He, had, he already had an order he of deportation. He already had an order of okay. deportation. And so um, it took a lot of effort to try to get the case reopened. And we were successful in doing that because we were able to argue that uh, he, he shouldn't have been given one to begin with. Um, but it took prosecutorial discretion not to have him removed. And he met the guidelines for prosecutorial discretion on the basis of being a son of a naturalized citizen, um, the spouse of a U.S. citizen and veteran. Um, he has U.S. citizen um, children, a, a clean record. Um, he's always paid his taxes. And so he really met a lot of the those criteria length of, stay too, right? length of stay over 20 years um, so he was really the ideal candidate for for someone to merit having discretion uh, on their case and so that paved the way to be able to to continue the fight to have the case reopened have the order of deportation terminated which then allowed for him to file for adjustment of status now he's a green card holder um, but it took 28 years and what are some of the other changes that you've seen? I've heard something about uh, provisional waivers. What, what, is, what does that mean? Right. Why is it called provisional waivers? Well, to start, a provisional waiver, um, when somebody stays here beyond a certain period, uh, either being at six months or beyond their, their lawful presence or a year, there's certain bars. Uh, with the six months, there's a three-year bar. So if the person were to leave the country and try to come back in, they're barred from coming back in for three years. The 10-year bar applies to people who have stayed beyond a year of their lawful presence and that that applies also when they leave before when a person was filed for as a family petition either through a spouse or through a familial relationship such as by a parent or um, or sibling as well um, in those cases the person would have to go to the immigrant uh, visa interview at the consulate and then they'd be told they, the officer would tell them um, that they couldn't um, grant grant it until they received a waiver and that's, that's because of the three and the ten year bar. Correct, because of the three and the ten year bar. So what happened is now the person has to go file for a waiver while they're outside of the country with no guarantee that they would receive uh, a, an approved waiver. Mm -hmm. So in 2000, uh, 2012, this changed. Um, what they did is it is a, now is a provisional waiver. So what it allows it to, uh, the person to do is that after the filing of a, of a family petition, instead of having to go to the interview abroad, they'll wait, they'll file for the waiver and they'll wait for the approval so that then they can go to the interview and they'll be able to come back in without it, without issue, so without that three or ten year bar applying to them. So now, the, so the difference is that with a provisional waiver, now you get it before you leave the United States. Correct. Okay. And, and that's the key. You have to get it before, because if you leave the country, you still have the bar and now you would have to file for it and wait for it outside of the country. Well, what does the government look for when they are deciding whether or not to grant the waivers? Are the waivers automatic? No, the waiver's not automatic. And the key is to have either a U.S. citizen spouse or parent to qualify for this waiver. So people have to be very careful because there have been cases that we have seen where a lawful permanent, spouse, a lawful permanent resident spouse or a lawful permanent resident parent, uh, I'm sorry, lawful permanent resident spouse files for their spouse thinking that once they get the visa, they'll be able to file for this waiver here. Well, they wouldn't have an immediate relative available because they're not married to a U.S. citizen spouse. They're married to a U.S. citizen, I mean an LPR. Spouse, uh, spouse. So that would affect their ability of receiving the waiver. So in order for to obtain this waiver, you have to show that there's extreme hardship that's going to be uh, uh, that's going to suffer upon that spouse or parent. And a lot of times, what you would try to show is if there's medical issues, uh, psychological issues, emotional issues, because of that separation that's going to take place. And not only the separation of you having to go back, the person applying for the waiver, having to return to their country, but also if that person had to go with you, the U.S. citizen had to go with you to your country. So it's, it's very detailed and very complex. So you would want to get the advice of an attorney uh, to make sure that you're doing it the proper way. Right. Sounds very interesting. Uh, but unfortunately, our time is up. We thank you for tuning in. I want to thank Melissa mcguire Manao and attorney Jorge Sevilla for their participation in Conozca Sus Derechos. The Hispanic Bar Association of Central Florida is dedicated to community service. And in our upcoming episodes, we will continue to discuss immigration legal matters and other issues important to the community at large. 
We wish to thank Orange TV for their assistance in bringing you this program. And for further information, please visit hbacf.com. Thank you for tuning in.